Hey, everybody. I am here in Golden Gate Park. Uh, it's a lot of avian activity at the moment. I saw a little while ago five or six hummingbirds chasing a uh, chasing a hawk <laughs> and I was reminded of you know Star Wars <laughs> by that um, I have so many things on my mind the last few days have held some astonishing insights for me uh, some of which are very medicinal relating to the nature of consciousness and its relationship with dreaming <clears throat> but also like most of us you know i'm i'm reflecting on the situation that we're currently engaged in and uh, I strongly suspect, it's hard for me to see how this wouldn't be so, that um, reopening the states and businesses and so on is going to turn out to be a really incredibly bad idea. Uh, and I was just talking with a friend of mine, and we were kind of riffing back and forth. And he was saying, um, in relation to the, uh, the factions, some of which are astroturfed, by the way. This is, a, um, this is a phrase that means they're purposefully funded to produce and profit from and inflame uh, dissent and factionation in a target population. Right, so if you know people who are really poorly educated and um, want to, you know, are inclined to confuse, um, <laughs> to become confused between, in, about the difference between really important proactive prophylactic measures and uh, fascistic authoritarian 1984-ish Orwellian um, conspiracy and uh, intent right? And, and I don't, you know, we live in a really complex world. So we live in a world where both those things exist side by side. There's aspects of what we refer to as our society, which is actually a lot more complex than it used to be. And we're not, <laughs> we're not endowed with the proper faculties or understandings or perspectives or motivations or tools to contend intelligently with, with that situation. So, uh, <laughs> the situation we're in is super complex, but, but there are factions that are well equipped and poised to take advantage of that. So, um, some of what we're seeing in the media and in um, the activities of people and groups in certain parts of the country, in certain places, at certain times, um, some of those things we're seeing are being f purposefully fomented, right? Like the, uh, you know, give me liberty or give me death kind of stuff. And like, if, if you were an enemy nation or even just a faction, uh, that wanted to harm a population, one way you could do that, if indeed masks are helping, us contain a highly contagious and very sophisticated um, pathogen, which it appears, you know, that appears to be true to me. Um, I think the pathogen's a lot more 
contagious and unusual than we might otherwise imagine. Um, we're in very early days, there's a lot we don't know yet. And the people who claim they do know are lying. <laughs> um, there's no way, it takes a long time for science to catch up, for researchers to catch up with a phenomenon. Statistics will never catch up with a phenomenon, but they're very useful in modeling what survivable behavior probably looks like. Yeah. In any case, so me and my friend were having this conversation and he was saying, um, imagine what would happen, what might have happened if there were a Democrat in the presidency um, in the sense of <laughs> would people have even, would the, the radical right, right, would they have even been willing to ever do social distancing or wear masks or anything, right? Or would they, would they have just gone nuts like right out of the gate? And that was a really curious uh, insight that I thought was fascinating because many of us presume that, well, it's hard to imagine a, a worse situation than the one that we're actually in where we have someone who's <laughs> nine kinds of brain dead sort of at the helm of, of this ship we call our nation. Um, and it looks like he just, he just keeps doubling down on stupidity, right? It's, it's hard to imagine a worse situation than that. But it would be weird if, for example, just due to the political divisiveness implicit in the modern moment, which also looks to me to have been intentionally manipulated and still being very much being so now, um, if due to that divisiveness, we'd have been in actually, we'd have had more trouble if we had a democratic president. That, that's a weird idea, kind of curious. You know, uh, we should be aware tactically that the United States has a lot of enemies. Um, we've done some really stupid things internationally over the past 20 years. 50 years, 100 years, I mean, pick, take your pick at the span. So we have some, we have some really serious enemies, uh, both abroad and endemically, right? Like, our own, you know, within the nation. And those people are currently capable of fomenting factionation and ideas, propositions, opinions, beliefs that can get a lot of people killed. So what you have is an unusual opportunity to conduct warfare that actually, you know, builds body counts um, with, with no physical weapons and very small amounts of cash. You don't need huge amounts of money, you don't need huge amounts of resources, and you can conduct this warfare largely without fear of discovery, um, blame, suspicion, reprisal, right? So in terms of how warfare has worked in the past, we're in this entirely new situation. And one of the sort of best ways, one of the easiest ways you could get people to attack themselves with their own hands, so to speak, is just to convince them that um, wearing a mask in, you know, when you're around other people is an imposition on their liberty. Of course, if you're dead, you don't have any liberty anymore. Should should be kind of obvious. Um, so, understanding the facts is really very difficult in the current situation. It depends on it depends on the purposes involved in deriving and circulating facts. Right? Different purposes, you get different facts. Now, there are simple facts like you're not standing next to me right now. Those, you know, are blatantly obvious. But facts about the nature and motivation of um, societal agents and information agents and um, layers of the construct we refer to as our society, facts about the actual pandemic, those are a little touchier. Um, 
It's true, statistics give us some information and that information is useful. Uh, in science, we have what's known as a confidence factor, which is like how trustworthy is our perspective or the models that we have that we're using to understand some phenomenon or to make predictions about it. Um, and that's an important idea, right? Because humans use something not as formal, but vaguely similar to a confidence factor when they evaluate information. Most of us are very poorly trained um, at the evaluation of information. And the more poorly trained we are, the more vulnerable, vulnerable we are and become to a variety of processes that involve um, overstimulating our th the aspects of our conscious minds that detects and models threats and futures. Yeah? If you overstimulate that thing, or if you break it off from other aspects of our minds that would normally correct it when it goes wildly astray, um, you get phenomena like we're seeing now. I don't have to call out anything specific. Um, and each of my viewers will have a unique window, a uh, personal window into that phenomenon. So we're in a really unusual situation. We have been for some time. It keeps getting more unusual. And part of the thing that makes it unusual is that we can't, many of us anyway, have, are having a very difficult time understanding which perspectives to authorize, which perspectives to see as with a high confidence interval, right? That they are likely to be valid or useful, that they more closely resemble the truth than the 17 other perspectives on offer. We're having a very difficult time with something fundamental to human consciousness and particularly um, conscious behavior, like having a perspective or an opinion or a belief or understanding what is, it, what is important to pay attention to, understanding which behaviors are reasonable given the circumstances, planning for the future, um, understanding the meaning of the past, all these things, they've been thrown into decoherence suddenly. And that's a perfect opportunity for predators. Um, in fact, uh, predators depend on producing decoherence in populations in order to take advantage of prey. Now, I'm not claiming that we're, we all comprise prey, but um, there are certainly organizations and individuals um, that are both predatory and or opportunistic that are interacting with us in a way that resembles predator-prey relationships now. And that's always been going on. Um, in fact, Facebook and Google and Twitter and Instagram and so on, P P interest and all these things, these are actually largely highly advanced information predators. They build power and wealth out of our behavior and activity, and they sell us back tiny little counterfeited broken versions of some benefit. Meanwhile, they like rise up on like mountains of cash. Amazon's another one. Um, cash produced by our activity, um, which if anyone were, you know, the reasonable beneficiary of that value, it should be us. And I have some models where uh, we can build systems like that, but that's not probably what I'm gonna talk about today. What I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit weirder. So, many of our inventions profoundly affect our relationship with time, two things, right? time and proximity. Hmm? In fact, the invention I'm holding in my hand right now profoundly affects both 
of those domains of my animalian experience, my organismal experience, my human experience, even my representational experience, my experience as a formally representational cognitive animal. There's a machine over there. Um, it's a motorized bicycle. But I'm going to talk about a couple of other machines. So, if you look at a city block in the city I live, right now I'm not near one because I'm in the park. But if you can, you've all seen city blocks, you know what they look like. Um, most of them are entirely surrounded by pavement, that's dead terrain. And then after the pavement comes the sidewalks, that's dead terrain. And then after the sidewalks comes buildings. And those buildings tend to be one of two types. Either they are what we refer to as businesses, which is actually spelled busyness, B-U-S-I, you know, N-E-S-S. So businesses. Um, and I guess there's maybe three types. There's businesses, there's storage, and there's residences. Yeah. So you've got the, the, the streets, right? Dead terrain paved over, um, like this stuff right here. This is ordinarily, this terrain is owned by machines. It belongs to machines. Um, so you've got this stuff, you've got sidewalks, and you've got these structures that we call buildings. There's that BUI again, by the way. Something interesting about that. Businesses and buildings. Hmm. In any case, inside the buildings you have either, you know, the machinery and furnishings and organizations of space and resources that are appropriate to business, or you have the similar uh, orientations and furnishings that are appropriate to residences. And those residences are usually structured to contain what is called a living room, one or more bedrooms, a kitchen, one or more bathrooms, and a long time ago, there were things like family rooms, which is sort of a take on living rooms, and studies, and libraries, and offices, and so on and so forth. All of those words are important, by the way, but I'm not going to take them apart right now. Um, then, so, so we're talking about the city block, right, as a as a distinct unit. Surrounded by pavement, that's dead terrain that belongs to machines. Surrounded by sidewalks, that's dead terrain that, that regularizes the behavior of pedestrians, right? Makes that behavior regular, which makes it more convenient, which makes it maybe a little faster, right? You can use it more quickly than irregular terrain. It's also more predictable. If you're walking on a sidewalk, you're much less likely to encounter some dangerous obstacle than if you're walking on, you know, natural living place land. <laughs> There's a, uh, a building over there. There's some city blocks nearby, but I still can't see them, which is a relief actually. Now, if you look at the city block construct, what you'll often have, if you're lucky, and you don't live, like, if you don't live in um, a place where the density is so staggering that there are few such things, there are places like that, perhaps Manhattan is one. Um, if the density is really staggering, you might not get much of this, but if, it's relative, if the density is relatively modest, then behind the buildings and residences, there are these little places of, you know, little, <laughs> usually squares or rectangles of land where living things are allowed. <laughs> um, 
and we have this stuff called grass and if we're lucky we might have a few trees or some um, herbs or maybe a garden where we can grow food but also where living things can be. Uh, we like to poison the hell out of those things. Uh, we use poisons to kill weeds and we use poisons to wipe out insects that we don't want most of which we never understood um, to begin with and also those damnable living things they're just so unpredictable and uncontrollable that the moderns um, who want really they're used to very significant controllable predictability they just kill the things that they don't have some immediate affinity or use for um, and we've done that inside our bodies right uh, because when we first discovered that bacteria could cause infections, I guess everybody decided, well, bacteria must be bad. There's these little tiny unseeable things that we can't control. They're all over everything. Better kill them up a lot. Of course, half of our bodies are made of these bacteria. Uh, half of us is non-human for us to be healthy. We have to have complex relationships with bacteria, particularly in our childhood. We need to receive inoculations of familial commensal bacteria, the bacteria associated with our matrilineal line and our patrilineal line from our parents. The, the matrilineal line is extremely important and inside our bodies uh, the mitochondria in our cells are actually the genetic children of the matrilineal line of our ancestry. So your mitochondria come from your mom. Now those are in our animal cells. About half the cells in our body are human and contain mitochondria from our matrilineal line. So you've got, you know, the street, the sidewalk, the buildings, and then inside that structured, weird, not living, like non-living places, right, you have maybe if you're lucky you have backyards and the backyards are usually <laughs> um they're kind of like representations of what we don't they're not really wild right we don't want wild animals back there and we get freaked out if there's rats or snakes or skunks or raccoons or possums or ants or wasps or just about anything that would ordinarily inhabit a natural living space. But we attract and uh, would like to relate with certain kinds of living things. So for, for example, most people like songbirds, they might attract, try to attract some songbirds. Of course, if they're putting poison into their yard, that is a non-starter for lots of other life forms, to put it mildly. Um, but, but people like to attract songbirds or hummingbirds um, and some people uh, like a few other animals and some people aren't terribly concerned about controlling um, the biome on the land they rent or own. But the thing I really want to talk about so, so in a sense, right, the city block, it kind of resembles, we could make an analogy that it resembles a cell where the cell's cytostructure, right, the outer um, sort of containing body for the cell, the, the cytoskeleton, is kind of like, at least vaguely resembles what we've described, as if the humans were instancing outside themselves the fundamental organisms on which their bodies are founded. Yeah. And the tearing down of that structure resembles what osteoblast cells in our bones do. They tear down old bone structure. And the building structure resembles something like what osteoclasts do in our bones. And by the way, um, we had these relationships kind of backwards in our science for a while. We believed that, of course, the builders are the intelligent cells, right? And the, the tearing down cells are not the intelligent cells. 
we had that backwards. What actually turns out to be more true um, with a pretty high confidence interval or um, confidence ratio is uh, the cells that tear bone down, that, that, break, that break up old bone, they leave chemical instructions for the, the cells that build bone, osteoclasts, so that they understand how to rebuild the bone that has been, that is being renewed, right? That has been um, dissolved by the osteoblasts. So it turns, down, turns out that the ones that break stuff down are the more sophisticated of this pair of cells. And there's probably a lot more features to that process than we've yet identified. Our biological science is still in very early days, a fact, an, an actual fact that people are prone to forget because there is the appearance of highly advanced knowledge. And actually we, you know, it's true in 50 years, We've gone from knowing nearly nothing about, you know, 60, 70 years, we've gone from knowing nearly nothing about biology to having an astonishing library of knowledge that is nonetheless far less than 1% of what's going on, right? So the fact that we have an astonishing library is a little bit deceptive. We don't know lots of stuff. Most of, most of what's going on is unknown. But to go back to um, our city blocks, I left something out. <laughs> I left out that machine for which the streets are constructed. I left out automobiles. Arguably one of the deadliest inventions mankind ever became infected with the urgent desire to reproduce and use. And strangely, those things look a lot, just watching some insect flying. They look a lot like demons, right? We built them with actual faces. And our houses, our, our, you know, our residences kind of have faces too, but the cars really have faces. And they're not friendly faces. And those things are, those devices kill just about everything they touch and much of what they don't. They can kill at a distance. They are the pri they're one of the primary reasons we've engaged in wars. Um, the combustion engine is arguably one of the deadliest inventions that mankind uh, produced up until around eh, the 1930s or 40s, but it, it's remained extremely deadly since then. Um, when we drive the cars, everything they touch is killed. If there are insects or animals or anything alive, um, the car just runs over it. And there's nothing in nature like that, right? So the, the world of life, the biosphere, is unprepared for a threat like that. People say things like, why was that animal so dumb to cross, cross the road? Well, it wasn't. Why was the animal driving a car so dumb as to just kill everything in its path, right? I mean, that's the more trenchant question for me. Um, why would you build a machine that just kills everything and requires fuel that produces deadly toxins in, by making it and transporting it and using it and burning it. Like, that's insane. Um, you, you don't want to build something that just kills everything everywhere all the time. That's a really dumb idea because eventually it's got to include you. And at some point in American history, there was this crime wave and there was a bunch of confusion about it. And eventually it was realized that having added lead to gasoline led to a certain form of brain damage that increased the human propensity to engage in violent crime, right? And they blamed it on all kinds of things before they discovered something like this. And as I understand the story, and I'm happy to be corrected if I've got this wrong, um, when we removed the lead, uh, there was a, you know, a fairly significant shift in the statistics that pointed to the idea that that was a reasonable correlation. But we've got these machines, yep, and they surround the city blocks, right? If you look at the city blocks, there's all these cars surrounding them, and they have faces, and they look like demons, and they're really, in a way, they're, they're advanced technologically. We certainly couldn't build the kinds of things that we build now 100 years ago, right, or 50 years ago. But the really weird thing about those cars is that 
there are two things I want to point out. The first is they are not, they are non-living things that use humans as their reproductive organ. We are the reproductive organ for a non-living population of objects we refer to as automobiles. And in that sense, and in their nature, the way they surround our city blocks, right? They resemble viruses of enormous size. Vos, yeah? So our city blocks are surrounded with these objects, very shiny, um, glistening, seemingly perfect, uh, regularized, the word by bilaterally symmetrical huh? uh, kind of like our own bodies and we've been obliterating each other in the planet to keep building and supporting these devices and they have a couple of really interesting features other than killing and attacking everything that moves and most of what doesn't all the time every time you use them um, and other than being status symbols, you know, humans are interested in status, particularly, well, males and females differently, but uh, at least um, idiosyncratically. So, they have a couple of other, other interesting features, and, and one of them is that they change the meaning of time, and they radically alter the meaning of proximity. So these viruses of enormous size that we've built, that we call automobiles, it's a really interesting name when you slow down and think carefully about what it means. Um, and they allow us to traverse terrain without intimacy. They allow us to conveniently and rapidly traverse terrain while learning nothing about that terrain, while damaging the living things in that terrain or killing them outright. And they change the nature of time by allowing us to accomplish travel much more quickly and with less and less intimacy as time goes on. We used to have to navigate cognitively with maps and memory to get from one place to a new other place. Now cars tell us how to get there with computing devices, which also, in case it isn't clear, affect our relationships with proximity and time. So cars change our fundamental relationship with temporality and with proximity. And those are foundations on which the nature of human relationships and consciousness and societies are founded. So when you change those with such a fundamental, uh, with such a fundamentally impactful technology or machine or habit, and all three really, then you change what it means to be human and you change what it means to have a mind and you change what it means to sleep, to dream, to love, to know to think, to suppose, all these things. If you change our relationship with proximity and time, everything changes. And I think it's fascinating to draw, to extend the analogy from these viruses that use humans inside those little residences, they use those humans to reproduce and fuel them those humans work to pay for the car, insuring the car, repairing the car, fueling the car, possibly improving the car, um, selling the car, buying the car, traveling, so on and so forth. The humans work to pay for that relationship with the cars. Or they're independently wealthy and they... Um, commit some segment of their wealth to processes involved with vehicles. And if you get really wealthy, you get to graduate from cars to things like yachts 
and aircraft, right? Um, both of which radically affect your relationship with time and proximity. And one of the things we all are staggeringly aware of now is that the unexpected introduction of a specific pathogen into our human societies, the pathogen that we're calling the novel coronavirus, which is still a fairly mysterious phenomenon, however much we might have learned so far, as if the we were a single we, it's like thousands of different we groups, each differently motivated, each learning and circulating different kinds of information for different purposes. But primarily, um, the medical and scientific uh, organizations, that layer of our, of our culture, is producing relatively coherent, relatively trustworthy, you know, mostly factual, early days facts, but factual nonetheless, information. So it's unreasonable to deauthorize that substrate of the information pyramid, right? But in any case, what we've noticed is that the introduction of this virus to our societies has radically altered the nature of time and our human experience of proximity. But it's done kind of the opposite Right? It is an inconvenient um, <laughs> sort of retro-temporal effect. Right? Now all of the busyness that we are normally engaged in came to a screeching halt and our complexly technologically dependent societies and cities and social constructs stopped functioning so that we could protect ourselves from contagion because we don't have either we don't have immune therapies for this virus now um, yet and it's not clear that we'll develop medications and treatments or even vaccines yet though uh, many different groups are working toward those goals so it's interesting that the introduction of a viral pathogen into our uh, lives. By the way, here's one of those machines. Uh, viruses of enormous size. <laughs> um, so yeah, the introduction of, of the virus into our, our daily life has radically altered our experience of time and of the meaning of space, particularly we now have to be concerned about proximity, the proximity of other human beings. And also we have to be concerned because we're no longer, it's no longer easy for us to take advantage of the viruses of enormous size, like cars and aircraft and so on that we use to travel with. Although, as you can see here, a lot of that is still going on. Right. And you can see up there the vapor trail of a jet aircraft. So the viruses, what they do is they, um, they carry what we might think of in technological terms. And we're probably confused about using technological terms to think about organisms because Organisms and technologies are extremely dissimilar. Um, organisms are unimaginably more advanced than any technology humans will ever produce. And I actually mean that. <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, the, the activities of a single cell in your body over a period of one second are more profound than the entire history of all human computation. So people who tell you like, we're going to simulate brains and, and you know, we're going to upload our consciousness into machines and so on and so forth, they're out of their minds. They don't understand what organisms are. And they've confused 
the incredibly crude technologies that we've thus far been capable of impressing ourselves with, <laughs> with the stuff from which we became capable of, of thinking about or deriving little functions and then making machines about that. Um, and that stuff is the biosphere and nature and time space, and light, time, organism. Yeah. The heart is not a pump. A pump is a mechanical derivation of one of the probably thousands of functions of a heart. Maybe millions, maybe trillions. In any case, what I want to be clear about is that technology never exceeds nature. Human humans that are motivated to produce devices and objects and machines acquire the inspiration and methods from observing technology. If we'd never seen birds, very unlikely we'd have aircraft. Um, but there's this really weird analogy between the car is using us as, you know, using us as reproductive organs, and other things use us as reproductive organs, and they're non-living things. Ideas aren't alive, but in a way, one could imagine that uh, they use humans as reproductive organs. This is the idea of memes. I've got to try to find another path here so that I can avoid the loud music. All of our media depends on us as reproductive organs. And what we call social media is really a kind of um, mostly disease pool of all the little media objects that use humans and our machines to reproduce them, thus changing our relationships with time, identity, meaning, proximity, and so on. So it's interesting to me that, you know, a virus is a little, a little packet of DNA or RNA um, in a capsid, which is its analog of a cytoskeleton, right? And what that does is it attaches to certain kinds of cells and delivers that payload into the cell and injects it into the cell somehow, gets through the um, cell membrane. And then the organs of the cell that ordinarily would produce things like proteins or maybe enzymes begin producing viruses instead. So the virus takes over the production-oriented biology of a cell and causes it to reproduce the virus and the cell fills up with little viruses and then explodes and then, you know, millions or billions of new viruses continue their progress through the, um, the human body and their relationships with the human immune system, presuming that the immune system can recognize and respond. And it's just kind of interesting that to me that uh, we've been as a species extremely unconscious of the costs and catastrophic stupidity of our relationships with machines that uh, we are both fascinated with and compelled by. Um, we have this almost hypnotic, as a species, we have this hypnotic relationship with devices, um, as you can see, right, right here. You can see people just like me relating with their devices. Huh?
And without this device, I could not affect the distance between us. I would be, you would be incapable of, you know, hearing me or maybe even encountering me. And I would be incapable of communicating directly to you or, you know, having this, um, this time together to explore ideas and, our, and situations. So I'm not saying there's no value in our relationship with devices, but when it overwhelms our inherent identity as organisms and the, the incumbent, the organismally incumbent relationships we have with ecologies and with the history and future of life on Earth, when our, when our hypnotic drive to reproduce machines and images and ideas and structure and so on, when that begins to obliterate the found, begins to, when that begins to succeed at obliterating the foundations of life on Earth and the unimaginably, unimaginably complex relationships that allow Earth to maintain homeostasis, right, a kind of balance so that complex life can continue to exist and develop, then that's going to feed back into what it means to be human at first in relatively survivable ways that we can, you know, ignore in the beginning, but eventually in ways that are absolutely catastrophic, that not only can we not ignore, they will impose themselves inextricably upon us. And that's because we're not a satellite phenomenon separate from or above biology or ecologies or the biosphere. We are an organ in a complex unity. It's a unity first, it's distinguishable only secondarily, and the kinds of distinguishing that goes on in minds inclined to, to transform living beings and places into abstract commodities, wealth and power, <laughs> that kind of motivation gets everything killed and is disembodied, right? It's not the kind of motivation you want to trust for more than a few seconds ever. So in a sense, we've been making giant viruses <laughs> that surround the cell-like structure of our city blocks Viruses that change our relationships with time, identity, proximity, relation, itself, right? Um, and now our species has become infected with a tiny version of something that does something very similar to ourselves, right? It makes little trillions of little deadly machines inside our bodies that attack the fundamental basis of, of our organismal survival, our organs, right? Um, damaging our lungs and our heart and possibly our brains and our circulatory system, having as yet unknown sequelae, unknown effects on, on our immune system. We can't tell uh, if the cultures, the, 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 the raging monsters of fictions, <laughs> Of, of fictional imperatives and purposes and motivations that we refer to as our cultures, we can't tell if those are going to survive. And I don't want anyone to be hurt or killed or die. I don't have any aggressive, like, vengeful sort of feelings toward humans. But for anyone who loves the living creatures and the living places, we are aware that for those to survive, something has to radically change and the humans will not change that radically voluntarily. Their supercultures will not stop being what, they won't stop doing what they've been doing, yeah? And the supercultures are almost like monsters. They're not humans, they're not beings. The United States isn't a person, right? It's not correctable the way a person is. Like, if you burn your hand on the stove, you're probably not going to touch the stove again. But the United States can burn its hand on the stove, and then it'll burn its hand on a fire, and then it'll jump into nuclear war, and it's just not, it's not a correctable, whoop! <laughs> it's not a correctable entity, yeah? There's no organ 
There's no structural organ in our supercultures or even in corporations, really, that um, <laughs> they're disembodied, right? If you don't have a body, you can treat threats and risk and harm any way you choose to. You can make up language about it. You can pretend it's not your fault. Um, you can pay the fine, which can't restore the dead ecology that you wiped out because you were careless and more interested in making money than, than you were concerned about a survivable future for living things or humans. So the, the corporations and supercultures can just go around wiping shit out wantonly, and there's nothing really to correct them. Except that, eventually, the damage we've hidden in the ecologies in wiping out the oceans and burning down the rainforest, the damage we've hidden in torturing the poor, the damage we've hidden, and it's not really we, but it's, it's the collectives, right? It's like the corporations, the supercultures, the large disoriented, misoriented groups that, for example, reproduce those, right? and support those things. There's one of those faces I was telling you about, right? It doesn't look friendly to me, yeah? That face, that does not look friendly. That is not the face of an organism. That is the face of a dead thing rolling. And that is a pretty damn good description of our modern supercultures. A dead thing rolling. Here's another one. This one, I think, is a little more modern. Yeah? Does that look friendly to you? Does that, does that look friendly? Does it look, you know, like a living being? I mean, when I see, like, a raccoon or a blue jay or a skunk or an opossum, I see something that I recognize as alike with me. When I see that thing, I see something that I recognize as the opposite of life. It's not merely non-living, right? It requires killing to keep not living, yeah? And in a way, that's not dissimilar to the function of a virus, even though a virus is a biological entity. And these things are mechanical entities, yeah? So, I don't know, I think, um, if I remember correctly, 30 to 40 trillion is the number of viruses commonly found in a human body. I might have that number wrong. Feel free to correct me. Uh, viruses are an absolutely crucial aspect of there being, you know, bio complex biologies on Earth. Once again, viruses aren't bad. In fact, it looks fairly obvious that viruses served as yet undiscovered but crucially important functions in the evolution of life on Earth and particularly in, in our own evolution, just as bacteria do. In fact, bacteria and viruses have a very astonishingly rich symbiotic relationship. But it's ironic that, you know, we invent behaviors and objects that recursively convert us to their reproductive benefit, except that how does a thing that's not alive benefit? What, what is benefit for something that's the opposite of alive? It's not clear. I guess propagation is the benefit, right? Um, meaning you get more and more of them over time. Uh, we should have recognized a long time ago that the propagation of, like everyone, there's tons of arguments about human population growth and so on and so forth. We should really, those arguments are important, I'm not going to dismiss them, but we should really be looking at the population growth of non-organic objects and technological objects and the costs of assembling and sustaining those and where those costs come from in the ecologies, our own bodies, our intelligence, our minds, our potential for survival in an, in an unpredictable future, because we've become the organs of propagation 
for diseases of non-living structure. Buildings and cars and ideas and opinions and beliefs and politics, right? We're like this juicy little mass of potential propagation for stuff that's the opposite of life. And now our people are experiencing a pandemic on many different levels, right? There's like, there's an infodemic, there's a technodemic, there's an econodemic, there's the pandemic itself, there's a politodemic. I mean, we're enmeshed in this very highly layered complex array of decohering processes. And for most of us, you know, in our waking lives, we depend on coherence. So when that stuff starts to decohere, um, our own relationship with knowledge and consciousness and our humanity will be deeply affected. Um, partially in ways that are shared, that in ways that we can all relate to, but also in ways that are uniquely personal to each of us or our families or our social groups, our, uh, our in groups, right? The us, whatever us means. And this word's pretty weird these days because the words we and us are used mostly abstractly to refer to stuff that, isn't, that was never intentionally um, that was never intentionally brought together under a set of agreements we're aware of and agree with and intend. Yeah? Instead, there's this sort of subscription by proxy, right? You happen to live in, in America, so you're an American <laughs> kind of thing. In any case, the virus is changing our relationships with time and proximity. And we should pay attention to that, really close attention, and learn everything we can about that together. Because time and proximity are sources, fundamental sources of cognitive, emotional, and relational, and purposive coherence. And when those are disrupted, that coherence begins to fracture. Yeah? And when that, that coherence fractures, that's a profound opportunity for predators. But it's also the end of comfort, familiarity, and convenience. Those things we've used machines so long to crudely reinforce. There's so much more to learn. And there's so much more I wanna share with you today. But for now, I'm going to return to the place where the giant viruses surround the city blocks. And I have my little box. And some of those little boxes have backyards with carefully selected living things within them. I'm going home. May you and those you love be safe and good, brilliant and true.